second chapter of Daniel prophesied the rise and the fall of four world ruling governments. The first one was Babylon, and we can discover this in history without actually looking at it. It doesn't specify all these different by name, but it does, according to history, when you go back and look at it and see what the prophecy called for, you can identify the first of those four world ruling governments as Babylon. The second is the Medo-Persian Empire. The third is the Greco-Macedonian Empire. And the fourth one as the Roman Empire. And it stated about the fourth world ruling government that there would not be another government system coming up that would be different from that one. In other words, there would be certain revivals of that system. And then the very final social system composed of either ten nations, ten combination of nations, would be extant and it would come from that system, the Roman system. And that this would be the one that would fight Jesus Christ. And you can find that in Daniel, the second chapter, verses 40 through 45. And that's all I'm going to concentrate on at this particular time. Verse 40 to 45. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Now, I'm reading out of the New International Version, so it'll, it'll be a little more modern English. Strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron. Now notice, clay and iron don't mix. They sort of mingle with each other, but they don't make a strong, solid, powerful substance. They're not, uh, they don't combine chemically with each other. That's what it's talking about here. Now we're going to see, before the sermon's over, I believe, that the way this final world social system is going to be set up by the industrialized nations combined with the third and fourth world nations which are impoverished and not industrially developed, they're not going to cleave together. They're not going to mix and mingle. And so that possibly could be an explanation of what this means. So this will be a kingdom divided. It will not be a solid and strong kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw in the mixed are iron mixed with clay. Verse 42, As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom, this final kingdom, will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united. See, that's the new international version, more modern. So it actually explains this mixture because you'll have industrialized, more educated people and then you, the have countries. Then you'll have the third and fourth world, which are impoverished. Ninety percent of the people are illiterate, such as India, Pakistan, and most of Africa. And so they'll not remain united because of this admixture, or this combining of peoples that don't mix together, any more than iron mixes with clay. Verse 44, in the time of the, those kings, these ten kings, which are the toes. So you had a head, then you had a breastplate, and then you had the sort of the, the midsection, the torso. These were the first three kingdoms. Then you had the legs and so on and the toes, and this is the Roman government. And at 330 A.D., you had a, a splitting of the Roman Empire once it started collapsing into two separate areas of the world, the western world of Rome and then of Constantinople. So that's the legs mixed, or they split. Then you had the ten toes, and that would be the final revival of this system before Jesus returned. Then in verse 44, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. So notice what's going to happen now. All of men's man-made kingdoms come first. And once God's kingdom is established, and it comes according to Acts 3, 18 to 21, to restore all things, then there will be no other governments. It will be God's government, it will be set up, and it will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. So it won't be heathen nations who don't know God. It'll crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will itself endure forever. Now, let's look at verse 45. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. So you had to read the first part of the chapter, too, and see the vision that King Nebuchadnezzar has, and Daniel interpreted. There would be, at the end of all this time, when the ten toes came on the scene, there would be a rock that was actually hewed out of a mountainside. And it would be supernatural. It wouldn't be somebody going up with a chisel and hewing out this rock. But it would suddenly come out and it would crush these ten toes of these nations and it would spread all over the whole earth. This is the kingdom of God. 
This is exactly what's going to happen. Now, let's go into just a little bit of this and see what happens. And let's see if we can't learn just a little more about this end time social system. So these scriptures of Daniel chapter 2 and then also of Revelation chapter 17. And I want to turn there and read it out of the New International Version. Revelation chapter 17, because this final world social system, it can be proven even by the prophecies of Jesus Christ that the ten toes are going to be those ten nations or combination of nations that are going to be extant at the end of the age. Revelation 17, 12 to 14, the New International Version. The ten horns you saw, and you have to look back in verses 1 and so on to see what this is talking about. The ten horns you saw are ten kings, or, as the Greek shows, kingdoms, who have not yet received the kingdom. So here are ten kings that are going to suddenly arise, and they're going to be rulers over kingdoms, but who have, who for one hour, this is a short time, will receive authority as kings along with the beast. So apparently there's going to be ten nations or ten kingdoms. Now within a kingdom you can have many nations within that one kingdom. Like the old Holy Roman Empire. It had several nations, at least seven to ten different nations under the confines of the one emperor. So this could be a combination of nations. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They, referring to these ten kings or kingdoms, will make war against the Lamb. This is the time setting. Who is the Lamb of God? John 1, 29. John said, Behold, the Lamb of God, referring to Jesus Christ, who takes away the sins of the world. So these ten kingdoms are going to make war against Jesus Christ. That means at the end of the age. But the Lamb, or Jesus Christ, will overcome them because he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And with him, notice this phrase now, this is our hope, will be his call, chosen, Realize that. If you really do have God's Holy Spirit in your mind, you are chosen. You're hand-picked and faithful followers. That's the key. First of all, you have to hear, hear a preacher to preach what this book really says. Then God has to look at you and say, Hey, his heart's right. I can choose him or her. Then he chooses you, and you learn this book from one end to the other, and then you become a faithful follower. These are the ones that are going to return when Jesus Christ returns. Because remember, Revelation 15, verse 2, we're going to be caught up to the sea of glass before God's wrath, the last seven plagues, are poured out on the beast system. We'll be a portion rulership at that time. Then we'll return to engage in the battle of Armageddon with Jesus Christ to destroy the armies that are surrounding Jerusalem to fight Christ at his return. But these scriptures of Daniel 2 and, and Revelation chapter 17 prove that there will be a ten-nation union that's going to emerge or a combination of nations to make up a kingdom, ten separate kingdoms. But now, let's take a look at the personality that could possibly be for this final world dictator. Because remember, the beast that rises out of the sea of humanity, Revelation 13 verse 1, says that this person is going to receive his power from the dragon. And the dragon we see in Revelation 12, 9 is that old serpent called Satan the devil. So this is going to be a person who is empowered, who is energized by Satan himself. So Revelation 13, 1, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. And the sea, according to chapter 17 of Revelation, verse 15, is the sea of humanity. It's all languages, nations, and peoples. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten horns on his cr or ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. I read that from the New International Version, a little more modern English. Six of these heads have already come up, and you can prove it historically. Six have come and gone since the original collapse of the Holy Roman Empire. The first one came with the imperial restoration of the Roman Empire when Justinian, in the Justinian Codes, in 533 stated that the bishop of Rome would be the head of all churches and that he had full authority to put down all heretics. And that was 533, and he actually came in once the kingdom or Rome was secured by the Roman general. So in 538, this actually started. Also, the pope at that time crowned 
Justinian in 554 to show the one was ordained by the other. They both put each other into official kingdom. That was the first rise of this final seven systems that would come up, and the seventh one would be ten combination of nations. Then the Frankish kingdom began in 774 with Charlemagne, and he was officially crowned as by the Pope in 800 A.D. Then the third revival was Otto the Great, and he was crowned by the Pope in 962 A.D. to restore the Roman Empire as a holy Roman Empire. Then the fourth revival came up. The Pope crowned Charles the Great in 1520 A.D. to establish the Habsburg dynasty. And von Habsburg was recently, within the last year, in the United States. He is a part of the Bilderberger Group in Europe right now working for world government. The fifth revival was when Napoleon came on the scene. Now this also was when the deadly wound occurred to the Holy Roman Empire. Napoleon stated that once the Pope died, who was very elderly, that he, when he died they would not elect another Pope. And so the Pope was hustled around from one prison to another and finally in the vacancy of the, of the uh, Pope ship in Rome occurred in 1798 and he officially died in February of 1799 in prison and then with the defeat of Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo in 1814 officially the Holy Roman Empire died first the religious part of it in 1798 and then the political aspect in 1814 now the sixth revival came it began to Italy began to be united in eight in the 1870s and by a man man by the name of Garibaldi Finally, the defeat of this little resurrection occurred in World War, after World War II. Germany, Italy, and Japan were all defeated as the Axis powers in Europe. Mussolini had actually made a treaty with the Vatican in which he stated that he would restore and reinstitute the Catholic Church as the state religion. And if they won the war, and if Europe became united, it would be a restoration of the old Holy Roman Empire. But with the defeat of Mussolini and Germany and Hitler, this never took place. The seventh nation that's going to arise, or a combination of nations that will fight Jesus Christ, has been described. We've already read it. It'll be ten combinations. Now look in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. The International Version says, One of the heads, this is one of the revivals, of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. That did occur. But now, it says the whole world was astonished because this system that had been lying dormant, it looked like it was killed out. Suddenly, it was resurrected. And it said the whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Now, why would the whole world suddenly follow this leader and this system, this governmental system called the beast system? Mr. William Shirer, who was a correspondent for the Columbia Broadcasting System, wrote in his book, The Berlin Diary, concerning Adolf Hitler's rise to power in the 1930s. And I quote, I got my first glimpse, a glimpse of Hitler as he drove by the Wurttemberger Hof to his own headquarters at the Dutzer Hof. About 10 o'clock in the evening, I got caught in a mob of about 10,000 hysterics who jammed the moat in front of Hitler's hotel, shouting, we want the Fuhrer. And he goes on, he says, I was literally shocked at the faces, especially those of the women. When Hitler finally appeared on the balcony for a brief moment, they looked at him as though he were the Messiah. Hitler's effect on people, and this is taken from a different book now, this is a different quote from the Occult Reich by a Mr. J. H. Brennan, 1974, page 24. He says, Hitler's effect on people was not confined to the production of hysteria in crowds. The magic, notice this, the magic worked equally well on a personal level. Goring, and this was one of his generals, who was, person, who was probably as close to him as any other German, collapsed under the impact of his extraordinary personality. How can you stand right next to somebody and collapse at a personality that someone has? unless there is supernatural magnetism there. It makes you wonder. Well, from an up the same book, The Occult Reich, page 54, I'll quote, I never heard Hitler in person, 
but I did by radio. Later I talked with some of the men who had been in his intelligence department. It was strange, they said. The sound waves of a speaker's voice can be measured in keeping with his emotions. Men have been able to make voice prints and tell the degree of the, of the speaker's anger, fear, or, freak, or fervency, but the vibration of Hitler's voice broke all rules and defied normal explanation. On this little graph, which this electronic equipment shows the intensity and the breaking, it was straight across. It registered nothing. So there had to be something supernatural about Hitler, possession by Satan or one of his high-ranking demons in order for this to occur. It had to be them speaking through a human being. Well, another very close associate of Adolf Hitler was Hermann Roshing. He said, he wakes up, referring to Hitler, in the, mor in the night, screaming and in convulsions. He calls for help and appears to be half paralyzed. He's seized with panic that makes him tremble until the bed shakes. He utters confused and unintelligible sounds, gasping as if on the point of suffocation. Hitler was standing up in his room, swaying and looking all around him as if he were lost. It's he, it's he, he groaned. He's come for me. His lips were white. He was sweating profusely. Suddenly he uttered a string of meaningless figures, then words and scraps of sentences. It was terrifying. He used strange expressions strung together in bizarre disorder. Then he relapsed again into silence, but his lips still continued to move. He was then given a friction and something to drink. Then suddenly he screamed, There, there, over in the corner, he's there! All the time stamping his feet and shouting. This is just a little of what Adolf Hitler was like. A man possessed and given power of Satan. But another man who was very closely associated with Adolf Hitler in his early life was a Dr. Stein. Dr. Stein was born in Vienna, Austria. He was a specialist specializing in international law. Dr. Stein actually lectured wisely, or widely all the way through Asia Minor. And he was also the guest of dictator, the dictator of Turkey, Kimmel Ataturk, on many occasions. So this man was highly acclaimed in the governmental world. He also was the man who accompanied King Leopold to, uh, of Belgium to England as an economic advisor. And King Leopold was the man who stood up in... Uh, the Guild Hall in England and first call for the European Economic Community or the European Common Market. And it was this man, Dr. Stein, who was his advisor. And both of these men, Dr. Stein and um, Leopold, King Leopold of Belgium, both belong to the Bilderberger Organization, which is trying promoting world government. Now, Dr. Stein stated, and I quote, Adolf Hitler stood beside him like a man in a trance a man over whom some dreadful magic spell had been cast. His face was flushed and his brooding eyes shone with an alien emanation. This is dynamite. I'll continue the quote. His whole physiognomy, his appearance and stance appeared transformed as if some mighty spirit now inhabited his very soul, creating within and around him a kind of evil transfiguration of its own nature and power. And then Dr. Stein came to a conclusion. He says, was he a witness, referring to himself, of the incorporation of the spirit of the Antichrist in this deluded human soul? Had this tramp from the Doss House, which is the lower side of Germany, the poverty area, momentarily become the vessel of that spirit which the Bible called Lucifer? Other people saw Hitler in this strange transformation as he rose step by step in power in Germany. And the same power is going to wage war against the saints at the very end of this particular age. But now we've got to go on in Revelation 13 verse 4 and ask another question. Let's read it. In the New International Version it says, Men worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. So they're going to worship 
the dictator and think he's the Messiah, but who are they really worshiping? Satan. Because he's the one who is the power behind the system. And they also worship the beast and ask, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? I think that's a good question. And I think each one of us should be able to ask that question and hope for an answer right out of the Bible. So what I want to do now is go into just a little background to see if this beast system is rising on the horizon, how it could be possibly instituted. Instituted. And then what about those ten nations or a combination of nations? Kingdoms, are they on the horizon? Okay, Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17, it says, He, referring to the false prophet that's going to rise up in verse 11, also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell. That's transacting business unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This word mark in the Greek language is sharagma. It means scratch, etching, stamp, or sculpture. And I believe, without doubt, this particular mark is going to be lines which are going to be sketched into our right hand and in our forehead by laser beam guns that have already been tested. They've been proven that they are a viable method. And the lines are so small because the little beam of light laser beam light is so small that it can literally cut through metal and yet it's such a pinhole that you can't even see it with the naked eye so it can put lines on the hand and they will be invisible to the human eye they won't mar your appearance at all but when you run it across these modern scanning machines then it can allow economic transfer of funds so i believe this is what's going to happen it'll be as permanent as your fingerprints and it won't be able to be removed at all so the mark cannot be, as many church organizations have thought in the past and are even teaching today, that it would be a German mark, paper currency, or a French franc, which the word franc means mark in the French language. I don't believe it can be because the international bankers and the multinational corporations are moving as swiftly as possible all over the world to establish this instant transfer of funds to eliminate what's called the float They'll write a check, and it may not go through and be cleared for 10 or 15 days. And so what they want to do is eliminate float where you'll have in four seconds the instant transfer of funds. And if a company cannot or does not have the funds in their bank account, they can't transact business until they have enough funds. And that way you totally eliminate credit buying in the industrial world. That way when a company is buying with you, you give them no, cur no credit so they can't wait for 90 days before they pay you in cash or currency. You either have it in your checking account or your transfer account right now or you don't carry on business. So right now they're beginning to push the debit card very hard all over California. And now I've got letters from Texas showing that they're instituting the debit card. And I had a conversation last Saturday evening with someone who is in banking here in St. Louis who said they're going to start in 1984 pushing the debit card in this community. So it is coming. They're already doing it in Cincinnati. They're doing it down in Texas, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, and they're doing it on the East Coast. So the debit card simply removes cash and currency. Everything is in a bank, and it instantly transfers fund from your account to the grocery store or a gasoline station. This means it will become a totally cashless, coinless, and checkless society. All you have is a plastic card. So they're moving one step at a time toward this final prophesied system where you'll, always, you'll do all transacting of business with these marks. Now, there are other things that are taking place in the world today, too. St. Louis County, now, all new library cards are nothing but barcodes starting with new people being issued library cards in St. Louis County, Missouri, which is the suburbs of St. Louis. Also, I'm going to be printing in our first lesson of a correspondence course from Psychology Today, April of 1983, page 65, a full-page picture of a supermarket and women walking up and down shopping, and in their forehead is emblazed the barcode. This is happening everywhere, but how is it happening? Is it on the world scene? I believe it is. Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17 is jumping out at us. 
And the French magazine Foyet Rye reported many years ago, I think this was around 1969 or 67 it was, June of 67, they reported from the United Nations organization in Geneva, Switzerland, that plans had already been worked out to dissolve the United Nations organization to make way for a world tribunal in which all possessions would be seized, all savings, all bank accounts, all deposits. Every man, woman, and child would receive a certain amount of money it would be in the bank. It would not be yours to have and a number. The number would give you access to that money to transfer. The money was already available at that time. It's called rainbow money in a bank, and it's waiting for distribution to the various banks wherever you would do your banking. Everyone with a number would be employed in either the administrative, the commerce, or the industrial or agricultural branch of this new world system. This project would plan also calls for a total unification of church and state single form of religion for all. Those in the New World Movement today, the New Age Movement, they are working frantically and they say that they're going to have to destroy three groups of people when the New World Order is instituted. Number one is Jews. Number two, Christians. And number three, Muslims. Why? Because all three groups claim Abraham and the real God as their God and Father. All of them. They all claim to come through Abraham to whom the promises were made. And so they have to destroy those three groups because the rest of the world is pagan as it is. And so they'll go ahead and accept the Luciferian worship which they already have already. The appointed day for the whole world to worship will be Sunday. And the number received by the people would promise the right to buy and sell. But at the same time, there was a Christian, and this happened to be, a Seventh-day Adventist. And this person stood up and asked what would happen to those minorities who would not go along with the system. This is a direct quote from the United Nations Organization representative. Their number will be canceled with a black line and they'll be deprived of the right to buy or sell and will thus be forced to destruction. That is their, the direct quote. And it was printed in Foyette Rye. This also was introduced into the Congress of the United States by a Mr. P. A. Del Velli, who was the president of the Defenders of the American Constitution. He also was a lieutenant general in the United States Army, retired. And he issued this information to the Congress so that they could try to do something about it and not allow us to go into the system. But it failed. Now, there is on the world scene right now a rise in Europe. There is ten nations in what's called the European Economic Community, or the Common Market. Now, what is behind this particular system? In the book, The Great Common Market Fraud by C. Gordon Tether, on pages one to three, I'm going to quote just a little bit of it. He says that there is an element of starry-eyed idealism about this, uh, this common market in Europe, and that the people in England have been snowed and given mistruth in order to get them to come into the European economic community. And he gives a very uh, in-depth in uh, portrayal of those who are behind the economic community in Europe. And this is what he says. It derives, this is the super state or super government that they're trying to create in Europe. He says it, re it derives its formidable firepower in the main from international big business giant multinational industrial and financial, that's banking, conglomerates, who have a considerable vested interest in the removal of national boundaries. And in 1847, a letter from Baruch Levy, from Karl Marx to Baruch Levy, stated that they had to eliminate national boundaries in Europe to unite it and make it a one European continent that would, from that area, they would expand and rule the world. And is it happening? Oh, we see it. It's happening. And these are the giant multinational corporations and financial conglomerates. Now listen to what he says. Through the almost total control of the press, see, if you can't have a free press so that the truth can be just, uh, presented as well as the side of big, big business, that its identification with big business gives it the pro-market lobby can, as the story of the 1975 referendum on British membership of the EEC clearly shows, greatly influence public opinion. So when you don't have freedom of the press, 
And when they print one side of a story, you can move masses and make them think it's the truth. And that's how they got Britain to go into the common market, because they control the media in Britain and in Europe. But now, he went on to show in this book that it's very significant that the leading people of the European economic community are all members of what's called not only the uh, Bilderberger Group, but the Trilateral Commission in the United States and Europe. And he went on to show that the American multimillionaire David Rockefeller in 1973 started the Trilateral Commission in order to promote, and I'll quote his exact words, the onward march of one-worldism. And he says that it has operated by creating a powerful international masonry. People who are working in concert for the same goals. And it's committed to advancing the cause of world government. And he says it's very interesting that those in the Trilateral Commission who are promoting the European economic community, they draw their membership from key positions in the corridors of power in the United States and Europe. Power. The power people in government. He said it's a combination of Western Europe, the United States, and Japan. And it's the people in the top echelons of business that are promoting it. And he went on to show that it was very interesting that Jimmy Carter himself was one of the founding members, along with uh, Brzezinski, his uh, advisor, and with David Rockefeller. So the three of them founded this, and that all the ranks within Jimmy Carter's administration, all those people were from the Trilateral Commission and the Commission on Foreign Relations. And he said, on page 3 of this book, that the hand of the Trilateral Commission and that of a parallel and older organization known as the Bilderberger Group could be seen at every turn in the evolution of the common market. And then he went on to show that George McGee, the former U.S. ambassador to West Germany, stated this, the Treaty of Rome was brought, which brought the common market into being was nurtured at the Bilderberger meetings. And these are the people the ultra-rich call the black nobility of Europe the people like the von Habsburgs who once ruled Europe and the Holy Roman Empire, Queen Elizabeth of England, her family. All these people are a part of this Bilderbergers group who are economically creating a world government. He went on to show that the market is the chosen instrument of the multinational corporations for creating a world fit for big business to live in. No wonder it said no one could buy or sell without the marks. Big business is promoting it. He went on to give a direct quote by Giovanni Agnelli, who was the head of Fiat Corporation and a member of the steering committee of the Bilderberger Group. Here's his quote. European integration, or a European one government, super government, is our goal. And where the politicians have failed, we industrialists hope to succeed. The question is, are they succeeding? Well, I think you can take a look at what is happening on a global scene and see they are indeed uh, succeeding. There is an organization now which was founded in 1969 and it was actually, um, it was being nurtured since that time, but it was, became a corporation in 1973. This was called SWIFT for abbreviations. The Society, it's an electronics funds transfer system. It's called the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Transactions or telecommunications. And it's the agency which these international conglomerates of financial institutions are going to create a cashless, coinless, and checkless society. That's the object, to eliminate cash, checks, and coins, any real money, so that they can control the world through economics. And this is exactly what's taking place. But the point is, they'll have all the money in the banks but they'll also have control of the whole system. So the SWIFT system is an organization that is being brought about in order to control all economics. Now, I want to read Mr. Karl Ruderskold. He's a Belgium. He happens to be the general manager of SWIFT of October 19, 1977. He said, in May of 1973, some 240 of the largest European and North American banks were set up the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, with the aim to design, implement, and operate an international financial network. 
This enables member banks to transmit between themselves international payments, statements, and other messages. The apparatus is now set up. But let's go on. In another statement he made, SWIFT, he says, is a cooperative society created under Belgium law. And Belgium is a part of the old Holy Roman Empire, a part of the Roman Empire that it said that last system would come up through Rome. He said it's wholly owned by the member banks. So is it true a document that was discovered in 1934 it was called the Banker's Manifesto, and it was for private circulation only, which stated that they would get the whole world into debt, and then as a direct result, they would control through economics everyone's life and return the world to an old feudalistic system of where everyone was dependent upon the overlords, and they are the overlords. Well, I want to go on in just a little more about SWIFT to give some of its global goals. In a news release... Brussels, Belgium, October 19, 1977. Mr. Lawrence A. Gosshorn, President and Chairman of General Autom Automation Incorporated, headquartered in Anaheim, California, today represented the company at the official dedication for the large international funds transfer network owned and operated by SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. Today's opening ceremony marks the creation of a common international banking language. Can there be any doubt as to what's going to happen when it is for instant transfer of funds and they've come out with a marking system on all products? Well, let's go on just, just a little further because we're going to see in their own publication, Swift publication, F2160, January of 1977, it states that this particular network in its first phase covers most of Western Europe and North America. It says it is a two-centered financial transaction control system. The banks connecting their terminals to programmable con concentrators in each country. Now, he says, although each operating center features fully duplicated computer configurations, a two-center design is used for increased security. In other words, they have to have two operating centers in case sabotage destroys one. They still have another communication network. But then he goes on to show in another bulletin, Burroughs Corporation put out in Future Developments of SWIFT. This was put out in 1977 also. And notice what they say. The SWIFT network cut over has now taken place. It's now installed as of 1977. Live messages are being transmitted. This means instant transfer of funds from New York to London. Different places, banks can instantly transfer within four seconds. And with SWIFT, boroughs are looking forward to the time when all current member banks will be connected to the system. All banks. And beyond that, now listen to this, not only its member banks, but beyond that to the inclusion of other banks and other countries. Until... The system becomes truly worldwide. No wonder it says no man can buy or sell unless he has the marks. Well, now I'm going to read from the book The Laws of Electronic Transfer by Penny and Baker. This was published in 1980, pages 9 through 14 and page 905. Here's what it says. It has two European switching centers. This is SWIFT one in Brussels and one in Amsterdam, and is currently building a facility in Culpeper, Virginia, where Fedwire has its center. It was originally believed that the Brussels center would be adequate to handle projected traffic through 1985. I believe from this we can see that there is truly coming an economic system. Now, in 1973, I've reported this before, but I'm going to mention it one more time, in the United States magazine, Senior Scholastic, it's distributed to high schools and colleges all over the United States. In September 20th, 1973, it gave the four or five steps in which this new monetary system would have to go through in order to be achieved on a global basis. It said all consumer goods must have a computer mark called the Universal Product Code. It's reality. We've had it for 10 years. Secondly, it says that all buying and selling must be done by computer, which now with a debit card, once it comes in, that will now start taking place. Thirdly, 
it says all special drawing rights must become the standard medium. No more cash, no more checks, no more coins. But you have to have just the special drawing rights from one your account into another account. And a fourth step, they said that every individual, but remember first, they said we had to have the universal product code, then we had to have all buying and selling done by computer. That's the debit card. Then the fourth step, later on down the line, they said every individual must receive a number which will be his national account number and his international account number in the computer system. And the fifth step said that the number must be tattooed on each individual so that it will never be lost. It'll eliminate fraud. So all of this is now taking place. The computer marks are here. The debit card is now being promoted in various parts of the United States. And as I printed in Newswatch magazine in a recent issue in 1983, in Springfield, Missouri, they said in two or three years we'll be using nothing but plastic, nothing but a debit card, no more cash, coins, or anything of that nature. So all this is taking place. Now, I've already mentioned this Psychology Today, April 1983, page 65, where it's a full-page picture of women going through the supermarkets, reaching off for goods off the shelves, and here they are with their computer marks and their forehead. Also, gasoline pumps are now using the debit card in Paso Robles, California, Houston, Texas, and they're now, they've been using them in mobile stations as a tryout in Kansas City, Missouri for the last year. And now St. Louis County Library cards all are barcodes. They're coming into all barcodes, starting with issuing of new cards. Now, if you want to prove to yourself that the universal product code found on all packaging is encased in the number 666, as Revelation 13, verse 18 says, that we should calculate the number, and it ends up being the number 666, all you have to do is find a Polaroid color film type 108, and then look on the back of it. The universal product code has four sixes from the second of the three sets. Then when you look at the little framework to the far left, right down the middle, and to the far right where there is no number underneath it, they match the six identically. So surely the book of Revelation is jumping off the pages at us today, and we are living in these times. But what is going to ultimately institute and bring a rise to ten governments or ten kingdoms, and it can be multiple nations making up those kingdoms. Well, I think we need to investigate just a little bit. With the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, the entire world suddenly realized that they had discovered something that could destroy all mankind. And now, according to Dr. Carl Sagan, there's enough nuclear wo weapons in the world in all five major countries that have nuclear weapons that you could blow up a million cities of 100,000 population and more. We don't have that many cities. There's only about 1,000 on the whole world with 100,000 or more population. So Jesus did predict that, for, that prior to his coming in Matthew 24, 21, and 22, there would be a time of great tribulation that had never occurred since the beginning of the world and it would never occur again. And unless that time was cut short, there would be no survivors on planet Earth. Well, we need to... Look at a few statements of a few world-renowned scientists. Dr. Albert Einstein, he said, and I quote, the secret of the bomb should be committed to a world government. Now, that's one of our representatives. He's the one who helped to manufacture or design the bomb. He said the United States should, be, should announce its readiness to give it to a world government. A friend of his, Mr. Raymond Swing, in a conversation, and he was quoted in the book by Willard Cantlin, the day the dollar dies, page 132 and 33, he said to Albert Einstein, either we will find a way to establish a world government or we'll perish in a war with the atom. Sumner Wells was quoted in the same book as saying, no world government of the character envisioned by Professor Einstein would function unless it possessed power to exercise complete control over the armaments of the earth. Remember Revelation 13:4. Who can make war with a beast? If he controls the entire armaments of the earth, no one can rise up and object to anything that he wants to force upon the civilization of this earth. Now, Albert Pike, as I've mentioned before, wrote a letter to Giuseppe Massini of Italy, who were two of the top illuminists in the world. This was all the way back in 1871. He said three world wars would have to take place. The third one would bring about a world government. Now, 
preparing for this world government, these Illuminists have already prepared a world constitution. And just like the United Nations said, they would, it would be superseded by a world tribunal. Now, the Britannica Encyclopedia's volume, Great Ideas for Today, in 1971 produced a 345-page, uh, on page 345, they produced a summary of this 4,500-page draft of this world constitution. It would have a chamber of guardians, the Supreme Court, the Grand Council, the Tribune of the People, and it would also have a president. Now, those who drafted this constitution stated that all nations were definitely leery of giving and suspicious of giving themselves into the hand of a government that had such power. And here's a quote that they made, and it was recorded in a book by Willard Cantlin, New Money or None, page 184. Perhaps it will take one or more demonstration of destruction of the atom bomb to make people willing to surrender to a world government. Now, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1972, or 1962, brought the world within the little pushing of a button. One step away, as Newsweek magazine of October 28, 1963 stated, we were one step away of pushing of the button. That's how close we were, and the Congress knew this. So the Congress of the United States allowed President John F. Kennedy at that time, on February 16th and February 27th of 1962, to sign what's called executive orders into law. These executive orders would actually create a dictatorship in the United States, just in case there was international tension or an economic or financial crisis on the world scene. Now, Executive Order number 10,995 gave the presidency the power to take over all communication media, radio, television, newspapers, all media. Executive Order number 10,997 said they could take over all electric power, petroleum, gas, fuels, all minerals. That's dictatorship. And Executive Order 10,998 said they could take over all food resources and farms. Executive Order number 10,999 said they could take over all methods of transportation, all highways and seaports. Executive Order number 11,000 said that he could have the power to mobilize civilians and create workforces under governmental supervision. Executive Order number 11,001 said that the President of the United States could take over all health, welfare, and educational functions in this country. 11,002 executive order said the Postmaster General, who is a member of the President's Cabinet, could operate a nationwide registration of all persons in this country. Executive order number 11,003 said they could take over all airports and aircraft. 11,004 stated that they could take over all housing, financial authorities and have the power to relocate whole communities and to build new housing with public funds and designate certain areas to be abandoned as unsafe. The reestablishment of whole populations in this nation. Executive Order number 11,005 said he could take over all railroads, inland waterways, such as the Mississippi River, and public storage facilities. And the last one I'll mention is number 11,051. And this is what designated the responsibilities of the Office of Emergency Planning and gave it the authorization and the power to carry out this dictatorship. Now, Mr. Kennedy willingly gave this power to the presidency of the United States. He was quoted as saying many times, if man does not bring an end to war, then war will bring an end to mankind. This is why he so willingly created laws that would supersede our Constitution and create a dictatorship in this country. You start looking at Revelation 11, verse 7, and when it talks about a world government coming where it would bear rule over all peoples, languages, and tribes. Then suddenly you look at Revelation 13, verse 8, where it says that all will worship the beast. And then with an international merchandising system, which SWIFT is now creating, you look at Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17, and it's jumping off the pages at us. Well, how is this total world government going to finally be realized? I think we can look and have a clue. Revelation chapter 9, verse 15. Remember, they've already said that it may take one more display of the nuclear war and the atomic bomb in order to cause all nations to submit to a world government. Revelation 9, verse 
15. I'm going to skip and jump right into the middle of this. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year was released to kill a third of mankind. And when you read up through here, you're going to find that this is talking about nuclear warfare and modern day weaponry that unleashes the atom bomb. And on back in verse 1 of chapter 9, it says, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven. The Greek word star does not mean an angel or a literal star in the heavens. You look it up in the Strong's Concordance, and it means a strowing of something. Just like you had pepper in your hand, and you threw it up in the air, and it strode all over the earth. Here is a strowing, and you read the whole chapter, and you see it's going to be nuclear warfare and the radiation that comes from it. And it says a third of all men are going to be killed. Well, with this in mind, let's go on. Could it be through this nuclear war that all people of the earth could literally die? Could it be? Or either they stop it and they create a world government to make sure mankind survives. They also have a world constitution ready to be implemented. I've already read parts of it. The world constitution. Then Revelation chapter 17 verse 12 to 14 of the ten nations or kingdoms that's going to give their power to the beast. Could this be done just for sheer survival of the human race? I want to read you something, and this is dynamic. From the Club of Rome report, Strategy for Survival Project. It was written by directors Mihayo Masarovic and Edward Pestel. This was a confidential report. It was put on paper September 17, 1973. It was the final strategic plan for the global grouping of nations to survive. I want to read them. There's ten groups. The first group, or it's called kingdoms, is the North American, Canada, and the United States. Group number two, or kingdom number two, is Western Europe, Andorra, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Federal Republic of Germany, Finland, France, Great Britain, Greece, Iceland, Ireland, Italy, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Malta, Monaco, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, San Marino, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Turkey, and Yugoslavia. That's two of the kingdoms. They've already got them grouped. Kingdom number three is Japan because it's the industrial giant of the Orient. Group number four, this is the rest of the developed market countries. Remember it said that there would be these ten kingdoms, five would be strong and five weak, some of iron, some of clay, and they would be brittle and they wouldn't unite together. When you look at the groups of these economic nations, you're going to see that it's exactly like that. Group four, Australia, Israel, New Zealand, Oceania, South Africa, and Tasmania. Group five, Eastern Europe, Albania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, German Democratic Republic, that's your communist Germany, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Soviet Union. Now do you realize why? After World War II, the United States was put off two years before they could go on and win the war so that Russia could move into Central Europe because they had to have the division of these nations so they could work out a world government. Every one of these nations which came under communist dictatorship after World War II are in this Eastern European kingdom, they're going to call it. Group six, Latin America. Argentina, Barbados, Bolivia, Brazil, British Honduras, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, French Guyana, Guatemala, Guyana, Haiti, Honduras, Jamaica, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Paraguay, Peru, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Uruguay, and Venezuela. Then the seventh grouping of nations, this is the seventh kingdom they call it, North Africa and the Middle East. Ada, Habe, some of these names are going to be kind of hard, Aden, Algeria, the Bahrain, Cyprus, Dubai, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Mascot, Oman, Morocco, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Trucial, Oman, Tunisia, and Ye Yemen. The eighth one, which is the eighth kingdom, this is the main part of Africa, Angolia, Burunda, Kabinda, Cameroon, Central African Republic, the
the Chad, Dahomey, Ethiopia, French Somali Coast, Gabon, Gambia, Ghana, Guana, Ivory Coast, Kenya, Lib Liberia, the Malagasy Republic, which used to be called Ceylon, it's an island right off the coast, Malawi, Mali, Mauritania, Mauritius, Mozambique, Niger, Nigeria, Portuguese Guyana, Republic of Congo, Reunion, Rhodesia, Rwanda, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Somalia, South Africa, Southwest Africa, Spanish Guiana, S Spanish Sahara, the Sudan, Tanzania, Togo, Uganda, Upper Volta, Zaire, and Zambia. That's eight of the ten groupings of the nations of this earth. Number nine, South and Southeast Asia, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Burma, Cambodia, Ceylon, India, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Nepal, Pakistan, Philippines, South Korea, South Vietnam, Taiwan, and Thailand. And the tenth and final one is the centrally group of nations in Asia, Mongolia, North Korea, North Vietnam, and the largest nation on earth, the People's Republic of China. These are the ten proposed nations that are going to come, and it's going to be a global world government, just like it says in Revelation 13, verse 7 and 8. So this report is here. This was given 7th September in 1973. So what did it say now? This global report for survival, they would put together ten kingdoms of the earth, and it would be multiple nations making up a kingdom, and it would be a global government. And these ten global governments would come under the jurisdiction of a world tribunal, and who would be over it? The beast, the world dictator. Well, we see in Daniel, the ninth chapter, verse 25, 6, and 27, that there is going to come a seven-year treaty with Israel guaranteeing their safety. I'm wondering, and I'm just wondering this, and we'll see as time goes on, but could it be that Revelation 9, where all the global nuclear war would take place and a third of mankind would die, could this be what would implement this world government this global community of ten kingdoms, and then suddenly out of that they would guarantee the security of Israel? I don't know yet. I'm not positive on exactly how that time setting goes, but could it be? And then verse 10 and 11 prophesies, or chapter 10, verse 11 prophesies that there is yet to be more prophecies to go on in the world. And there is someone who is going to do them, someone who is going to be given power in chapter 11 of, of Revelation, when this world government comes up and there is a beast, suddenly something is going to happen. God is not going to allow the total extermination of all Christianity and all truth from this earth. When this world government comes up, look what's going to be happening in Revelation 1. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there. Now I wonder, and I'm just wondering this because I'm not fully set in my mind, but could it be that this is an inset chapter when this global ten governments come up and the beast has now gained power, suddenly the Jews are told, hey, you can now rebuild your temple and reinstitute your sacrifices and here they're measuring the temple. Then in verse 2, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They'll trample on the holy city for 42 months. Could it be that they build this temple? They don't build an outer court, though, like they used to have. But for three and a half years, they're going to offer these sacrifices. And then after those three and a half years, then that's going to be the time of the Gentiles for another three and a half years where they're going to trample down the city. But what's going to happen when they're building this temple here? Verse 3, I'll give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. I think you find that in Zechariah chapter 4. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. Now, just think about that. If these two witnesses are given the very power of God so nobody can kill them, and they're now established a one-world religion where everybody has to be a part of it, or else 
you're excommunicated from the system. Everyone must take the marks on the right hand or far or they're excommunicated into destruction. And there is a persecution of true Christians, but these two men have the very power of God and nobody can kill them. Okay? Fire even comes out of their mouths and it devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Because, you see, true religion is being destroyed. It's being cast down by the system. But there are witnesses. God has never allowed the earth to be where no one knew the truth of God. He's always had a witness in it. There was Noah. There was righteous Abel. You see, there's at least been one witnessing the entire time. Now, verse 7, when they have finished their testimony, that's 1,260 years, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and kill them. What happens at the end of three and a half years of the seven-year treaty? The beast stops the daily sacrifices. He's killed these two men. Look in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13. Verse 4, men worshiped the dragon because he had, given, he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Could it be that when these two witnesses are killed, suddenly the beast says, look, I'm God. I'm the Messiah. I have ridded this earth of the two false witnesses. And he was the only one that had the military power to overcome them. And suddenly now he moves into the temple area. How close could we be to this period of time? I don't set dates, but the archaeologists have discovered the Holy of Holies underground from the old temple, and they won't go in it. But directly through the ground and above it, they now have seven pillars set up directly above it. They have now asked, and they're going to propose this, and ask that aircraft, on an international level, will not fly across the airspace going directly above this Holy of Holies. All they have to do is set up a temporary, just like they did in, when Israel wandered through the wilderness, coming into the land of Palestine. All they have to do is set up a temporary tabernacle and then an altar to start offering sacrifices when all this takes place. This is how close we're coming. I don't set dates, but we can certainly see by the trends that are going on these things are going to happen. But Revelation 13, 15 to 17, then when this beast moves into the temple and he literally sets up and he claims to be God, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, this beast system is going to move in. Once he kills these two witnesses, Nobody else could do it. So he's going to claim to be the Messiah. He's ridded the earth of those who are destroying it because, remember, they're turning water to blood. They're not allowing rain, so you're going to have droughts showing, hey, this guy is not of God. He's a false Savior. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. People were reporting that Jesus had already returned and the day of the Lord had already gone by. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 2. For that day, the day of the Lord, will not come until the rebellion occurs. The rebellion. It says in the King James, I think, a great falling away occurs. But it is the rebellion. It's a definite rebellion where Satan once again tries to take control of the whole earth and is worshipped as God. This is the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The, do the man doomed to destruction. Notice, he opposes and exalts himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped and even sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. God. How close are we to this? And once he goes into this temple area, he is going to set up the image of the beast that's going to both speak, and we could not understand this until modern day computers and robots have been brought into existence. Omni Magazine this last year 
had a fantastic magazine all dedicated to computers, robots, and it showed the circuitry in a head. Here is a robot looking just like a man, and it broke, broke open the front and showed all the circuitry. And then it broke open the back of the head and showed the circuitry in there, and it looked just like a man. When is this going to occur where this horrible abomination is set up and the forced instant transfer of funds? I believe that it is sneaking upon us, and I believe that it is coming very soon. Now let's draw all this to a close. In, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2 and 3, I think when all of these things happen, and of course with new evidence, I can all, I'll always change my understanding and my belief, but I believe all of these horrifying events are going to come first, and then when the stopping of the daily sacrifices occur, as it says in Daniel 9, 10, 11, and 12, then this man of sin, because he's killed the two witnesses who had the very power of God, therefore he claims to be more powerful and the true Messiah. Then suddenly, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2 and 3 could become reality. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now it comes as a thief to those who don't expect it. For when they, this is the world, shall say peace and safety. So here the two witnesses have been killed. They're off the scene. There is no one left in the world objecting to this final world system that is saving mankind from total destruction. So when they say peace and safety, notice what happens. Then sudden destruction comes. Why? Because it's the day of the Lord. Jesus is going to pour out his final plagues of Revelation 16 after New Testament Christians are caught up to meet him at the sea of glass because we'll not go through it. And it says, Then sudden destructions come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. I think this is going to be the setting after the two witnesses are killed and the whole world will accept the Messiah and say, It's peace at last. We're secure. But brethren, what are we going to do now? What about us? We are New Testament Christians. We know that all these events are going to come upon the earth. In Matthew 24, Matthew 24, it gives us some very comforting words. Matthew 24, immediately after Jesus has already given the signs of the time. He says in verse 32 to 34, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, you, New Testament Christians, my disciples, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. This generation that sees the UPC code, this generation that sees this, well, it started in at least 1973, this generation alive today is going to see these events coming. But then he said to look up. Well, let's turn to Luke 21. This is a parallel chapter having to do with what Jesus was talking about, his final events. Matthew, or Luke 21, verse 34 to 36. Take heed to yourselves. And this is a warning. He says, take heed. And this is each one of us. Lest at any time your hearts or your attitude of mind be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this world. In other words, degenerating and going backwards instead of setting your mind first and foremost on the kingdom of God and looking for the return of Jesus Christ and us taking over the rulership of this world with Him unless we go back and digress and we'd rather have the big automobile, the big home, the fancy clothes and go back and forget what God's doing in our life. And so that day comes upon you, New Testament Christians, unaware when there's no excuse for it coming upon us. He's already given us all the signs. Verse 35, For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch you, New Testament Christians, therefore, and pray always that you, the disciples of Jesus Christ, may be accounted worthy to escape all these things. That shall come to pass, and notice what else, pray also that you will stand before the Son of Man. This is dynamite teaching. But this is comforting because in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20 to 21, Isaiah 26, verse 20 and 21, we can pray to God 
and pray that we stand through all these things and then ultimately stand before Jesus Christ on that sea of glass and hear Him say, Well done, you good and faithful servant. I gave you authority over ten talents. Have you authority over twenty cities? You've doubled. You've had over five. You've doubled it to ten. Have you authority over ten cities? Isaiah 26, 20-21. Come, my people, enter you into your chambers. Shut your doors about you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. Protection of God through all these horrifying events so that we want to be on God's side and not be left out and exposed to all the dangers that are coming. Verse 21, For behold, the Lord comes out of His place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The word iniquity means lawlessness, violator of law. And if we're keeping God's law, why should we be punished with everyone else? That's why I said in chapter, in verse 20, Enter in and hide yourself until the indignation be overpassed. The last scripture. Brethren, never get your eyes off what you're going to be doing. And if you don't, you'll never fall no matter what the pressures are. In Isaiah chapter 2, this is what you and I are going to have opportunity to institute with Jesus Christ when He returns to this earth. Verse 2 of chapter 2 of Isaiah, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain or the nation of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. The kingdom of God and all nations on earth coming to the kingdom of God. And many people shall go and say, Come you and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, Israel. And He will teach us of His ways and we'll walk in His paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law. And if we're law keepers, why should we have to go through these horrifying events? We'll be protected. It's only those who feel they're Christian but aren't walking by the laws of God that are going to have to go through this great tribulation period and be martyred to make themselves white in the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into share pl- uh, sh- plowshares. No more implements of war. We're going to extinguish war from the earth and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And the final scripture for today is in Micah. It's chapter 4. It's a parallel scripture. But I want to show you your destiny as a New Testament Christian. You're going to be working with Jesus Christ. And in verse, verse 4 and 5, But they shall sit every man under his vine. This is the peace that's going to be when Jesus Christ rules. And under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. Verse 5. For all people will walk every one in the name of his God. Think about that a minute. What if you have overcome and you have gained five talents and when you only had one but you worked for God and you spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and he says, well done, you good and faithful servant. Have you authority over five cities? The people are going to rest under their trees. They're going to be out in their vineyards and they're not going to be afraid because you're their God. You're a son of God and you've been changed to spirit and you're going to walk in the name of... Each person is going to walk in the name of his God and that's going to be you. And we... Notice the whole earth, we as the sons of God, will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. The whole earth is going to walk in the name of His God who's ruling that particular city and we're going to point the whole world to Jesus Christ as their Savior. King of kings and Lord of lords, this is your destiny. Don't let anything take it away from you.